Welcome to Convite House Pathology for the second in the series of introductory pathology lectures that form part of the movement and musculoskeletal biology sessions for year two students of UCL. This is the third video as the first lecture was split into two parts. This lecture covers neoplasia not from a genetic point of view but as a basic introduction including the definition of what neoplasia is and some examples of neoplasia in the musculoskeletal system, particularly benign tumours of bone and muscle and sarcomas. Let's begin with some definitions. Metaplasia is a change in form, as its name suggests, from one mature tissue to another. Examples of metaplasia include the lower end of the esophagus and the uterine cervix, both of which have a squamocolumnar junction, which will undergo squamous metaplasia. Metaplasia is an adaptive substitution. In the cervix, at the squamocolumnar junction, columnar epithelium becomes squamous. In the esophagus, particularly if there's gastrointestinal reflux, the lower end of the esophagus becomes lined by columnar mucosa, so-called Barrett's change. If you consider the lung, when these lectures were live, I used to ask the audience how many squamous cells there were in a normal lung. And the answer is zero. There aren't any squamous cells in the normal upper respiratory tract. How then do we get squamous carcinoma of the lung, which is the commonest lung cancer? Well, the simplistic answer to that is through squamous metaplasia. If the airways are irritated, normally by cigarette smoking, they undergo metaplasia and are then lined by mature squamous cells. These cells in turn become dysplastic and then neoplastic. Of course, this is a rather simplistic way of looking at things. Firstly, when we talk about metaplasia replacing one mature cell type with another, it does not mean that columnar cells change into squamous cells or vice versa. That doesn't happen. All the cells are derived from stem cells and the stem cells undergo a different adaptive differentiation depending on the environment in which they find themselves. Not everything is genetic. The precursor cells can be reprogrammed, so-called transdifferentiation, or alternatively, the mature cells can simply migrate, if there's a squamocolumnar junction, to occupy territory in which they would not normally be found. In the same way, the explanation of squamous cell carcinoma of the lung as being due to metaplasia is simplistic and, in fact, wrong, because it's not the mature metaplastic cells that become squamous cell carcinoma, but stem cells. However, the principles are the same. They are undergoing a different type of differentiation that's driven by changes in their environment. What do we mean by dysplasia? Where you find metaplasia, dysplasia is not far behind. The cervix, for example, and the esophagus in Barrett's esophagus are notorious areas in which dysplasia can occur. And dysplasia is abnormal differentiation of a cell, but falling short of neoplasia. Instead of forming a normal mature cell type, the cell is in some way abnormal in its morphology. It generally has a more primitive form. A larger nucleus, less differentiated cytoplasm, is more mitotically active and has a less orderly architecture. High-grade dysplasia is a premalignant lesion and the highest grade of dysplasia is normally equivalent to carcinoma in situ. So high-grade dysplasia of the cervix, CIN3, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, is the same as squamous carcinoma in situ. Now we're ready to attempt a definition of neoplasia. This is far from easy. If you think back to the first lecture, rubor, tumor, cal or dolor, a tumor is a swelling. We might talk informally about a neoplasm being a tumor, but there are tumors, swellings, that are not neoplastic. What then do we mean by a neoplasm? The definition that I'm using here is adapted from that proposed by Rupert Willis, one of the greatest pathologists, an Australian working mostly in the 1950s, who wrote some seminal books, including The Borderland of Embryology and Pathology, 
and his definition was as follows. An acquired abnormality in which there is abnormal, uncoordinated and excessive cell growth. Neoplasia has to be acquired, it can't be congenital. It has to be abnormal. This, for example, would rule out pregnancy. The growth has to be excessive, disproportionate and uncoordinated with growth in the rest of, of the body, which persists after the initiating stimulus has been removed. In other words, it's autonomous. This again would eliminate phenomena like hypertrophy of the uterus during pregnancy and also enlargement of the endocrine glands in response to metabolic changes. And a part of the definition that's been added, it involves genetic changes in the neoplastic cells. This is true, but it's not necessarily capable of defining neoplasia. In future, we will have to consider whether the so-called genetic diagnosis of cancer is possible, whether it is possible to make a diagnosis on the basis of the genetics alone without considering growth and morphology. This is a complex subject which we won't go into here, but all I will say at present is that the limitation of this is that we know the genetics of cancer because tumours have been sampled and analysed, their genotype has been sequenced, and that's how we know the genetics of a particular tumour. And we know what the tumour was because somebody diagnosed it morphologically. Therefore morphology is the starting point, and if the morphology is wrong, the genetics is wrong. So at present, the genetics of a tumour is not a primary identifier, it's a secondary identifier that's predicated on morphology that's established by the pathologist. Given that this is the case, it's extremely disheartening that tissue banks sell tumour genomes without making any acknowledgements to the pathologists who diagnose them. Tumours are classified into benign and malignant. Benign and malignant are words that have ordinary meanings in English. Benign means nice and malignant means nasty. And by and large this is true, however it's as well to remember that a benign tumour can be fatal, for example a tumour of the epiglottis, an intracerebral tumour can cause death through raised intracranial pressure, so it's not benign in the sense that it does not do you any harm, it's simply benign in the biological sense that it isn't malignant. What then characterises a malignant tumour? The prime characteristic of malignant tumours is that they metastasize. If you metastasize, you are almost certainly malignant, although there are occasional exceptions. There are some so-called benign metastasizing tumors. And the second phenomenon is an infiltrative margin. A benign tumor tends to be well circumscribed. Benign tumors can also be larger, and very large tumors, football size or bigger, are almost invariably benign because a malignant tumor would not get to that size. If you can shell out a tumour easily, it is almost always benign. The malignant tumours with their infiltrative margins invade the surrounding normal tissues. And they have the crab-like adhesiveness, which gives rise to the name cancer. And they are difficult to resect, and it's difficult to identify a clear resection margin. Benign tumours are slower growing, but slow has to be seen in contexts. Even cancers do not grow that fast and it will be about five years before a malignancy has gone from being a naughty cell to being a tumour mass large enough to be detected clinically. Malignancies also have less resemblance to the parent tissue. And again, it's as well to bear in mind that although we speak informally of a parent tissue, the malignant tumour is not derived from mature cells. So a squamous cell carcinoma is not derived from mature squamous cells but from precursor cells. Therefore, the tissue it doesn't resemble is not actually its parent, but the tissue it ought to have been. So a malignancy is less like a normal tissue. A benign tumour is more like a normal tissue to the extent that some benign tumours are indistinguishable morphologically from the corresponding normal tissue, except through their pattern of growth. Using the musculoskeletal system as an example, the names of tumours identify their malignant potential. The benign ones end in oma, lipoma is a tumour of fat, chondroma is cartilage, osteoma is bone, 
lyomyoma is smooth muscle, rhabdomyoma is striated muscle or skeletal muscle, and an angioma is a benign tumour of blood vessels. The corresponding malignancies are liposarcoma, chondrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, lyomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and angiosarcoma. Carcinomas are malignant tumours of epithelia. Malignancies spread by direct invasion of adjacent tissues, via the lymphatics, and in the bloodstream. Sarcomas differ from carcinomas in that lymphatic spread is rare, and one would rarely see a sarcoma that had metastasized to a lymph node. Let's have a look at some histology. Here is a hematoxyl in a neosin stained section of a malignant tumour, and obviously I've picked the most malignant looking malignant tumour that I could find. I'm not exactly sure what this was, but it doesn't matter. It's just used to show all the features of malignancy. Why would we want to make a histological diagnosis? Well, the reason is simple enough. You could wait until the tumour metastasized and then you'd know it was malignant, but the role of pathology is prognostication. If you can predict from the histological appearances that a tumour will be malignant, you can excise it and this will have a beneficial effect on your patient. So what do you look for? The thing you don't particularly look for are mitoses. Everybody says mitoses mean malignancy, not really they don't, and for example in the normal endometrium there's a higher mitotic rate than in any malignant tumour. So a mitosis of itself does not betoken malignancy, although there are some tumours where the mitotic count is important in deciding whether they will behave in a malignant fashion. Because tumours divide rapidly, they don't have time to make cytoplasm in between divisions, so they end up short of cytoplasm. They have a higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Also, because the genetic material in the nucleus is constantly dividing, it remains clumped, it's darker staining, so the nuclei are hyperchromatic, of darker colour. They exhibit hyperchromasia, this dark bluish purple colour, and this is another characteristic of malignancy. The nuclei have an irregular outline, they have prominent nucleoli, again because the genetic material in them is constantly dividing, and they bear little or no resemblance to any kind of normal cell. They may not get round to dividing at all, in which case the cells will be multinucleated, not to be confused with things like Langerhans giant cells, which are multinucleated anyway because they're macrophages, and these aren't to be confused with Langerhans cells, which aren't the same kind of cells at all. If there are mitoses, a sign of malignancy is that they are abnormal. There should very rarely be abnormal mitoses in benign tissues. A normal mitosis in metaphase looks like Charlie Chaplin's moustache. An abnormal mitosis, as here, looks something like the Mercedes-Benz sign, or even more peculiar, with four or five rays coming out, and obviously has more than the normal number of chromosomes. In summary, then, the histological signs of malignancy are high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, abnormal mitoses, hyperchromasia, irregular nuclei, and multinucleation. These will allow us to prognosticate that a biopsy will behave in a malignant fashion. Let's think about differentiation. As a precursor cell becomes a mature tissue, it differentiates. It has fewer options as differentiation proceeds until it's terminally differentiated, it's reached its final mature form. When we look at a malignant tumour, we can compare it with the normal tissue and make an estimation of how well differentiated it is. The simple way of doing this is, if you're having trouble telling it is a malignant tumour, it's well differentiated. If you're having trouble telling what kind of tumour it is, it's poorly differentiated. And that leaves a middle ground of moderately or moderately well differentiated tumours between the two extremes. This is the grade of a tumour and is useful for prognostication. A high grade tumour is a poorly differentiated tumour, is a tumour that will metastasize sooner and will behave badly.
here we see another histological picture of a tumour that's very, very bad indeed, with a great variation in nuclear size between different cells, which is known as anisonucleosis. We see multinucleation, prominent nucleoli, hyperchromasia of the nuclei, and the chromatin pattern is abnormal and speckled. These are the kinds of changes that allow cytological diagnoses to be made on the basis of a single cell. This then is the basis of histopathology or cellular pathology. It has a value in prognostication in that it aims to tell you how well or badly a tumour will behave. At the moment, morphology is the gold standard for diagnosis. And clearly a pathologist is always going to say how useful pathology is. However, it isn't necessary to do histology if the diagnosis is obvious. There's a well-known Larson cartoon of a caveman looking down a giant microscope at a mammoth and saying it's a mammoth. So if your patient has a, an ulcerating breast cancer or a prostate cancer that's metastasized to the bones with a prostate-specific antigen of above a thousand, nothing is to be gained by trying to render a histological diagnosis. The horse has bolted and it's too late. Happily, there is no genetics in this lecture because I don't know any, but it's clearly a complicated business and there are many steps on the way to malignancy. One can intervene in the malignant process in these stages and also it means that there are subtle changes in cells in a pre-malignant state that can be picked up histologically. The great German embryologist Victor Hamburger likened differentiation to a train going over the points. Every set of points you go over limits the potential number of destinations until when you've gone over the final set of points you are committed in embryological terms you have no alternative but to get to your final destination and that is terminal differentiation as the type of cell you're going to be. On the way there you do have some chances before you're terminally differentiated in altering direction somewhat. When an ovum is fertilized the cell is pluripotent. It can form every kind of tissue there is. Then as differentiation proceeds cells become multipotent. Then they undergo various degrees of differentiation until they are fully differentiated mature tissues. You can't go from a mature cell to another embryo. You can't clone someone from a skin cell. You have to use a stem cell to do this. Let's have a look at some concrete examples of bone and soft tissue tumours. Here we have the commonest tumour in the world the uterine fibroid. It's the commonest tumour in the world because there are lots of uteri in the world and lots of fibroid uteri have more than one fibroid. Some of them have many, many fibroids, thereby making it the commonest tumour. It's a tumour of smooth muscle. It's a lyomyoma. It has about the consistency of a potato and you can indeed carve them into shapes and make potato block prints using uh, lyomyomas if you are so minded to do, you can see from the picture that they can be shelled out easily. They're well circumscribed. This is a, an indication of, of benignity. They also have other features of benign tumours. They are homogeneous or homogeneous. They lack any kind of variation. They, they don't have an infiltrative margin. They don't show any necrosis. They are the epitome of a benign tumour. Once the uterus is removed, the patient is cured. Histologically, the cells look bland and unexciting. I'm always reluctant to describe histological appearances as unexciting because many of you may fail to accept that histological appearances could ever be exciting and I'd have a certain amount of sympathy with that. But even, even in a sphere of activity that's generally unexciting, these are particularly unexciting. You'll note that they have nuclei of more or less the same size and shape. There are no mitoses to see normal or abnormal. They have reasonable amounts of cytoplasm. They do not look particularly different from smooth muscle, except that they perhaps have slightly less organization. 
here we have a radiograph of a finger. This is a proximal interphalangeal joint, so the tumours of the middle phalanx. And you can see there's a lytic lesion here eroding the bone. Now, you might think this has to be a malignant tumour because it's eroding normal tissue, therefore it's invasive. However, you'd be wrong. It's eroding the bone simply because it's pressing on it, and a benign tumour can erode adjacent tissues because of pressure. That isn't the same as invasion. And if you draw a line around it, the outline of the tumour is fairly well circumscribed. If we do a biopsy and have a look at it histologically, you can see that, as its name suggests, the giant cell tumour contains these giant cells, which resemble osteoclasts, which are a kind of macrophage. The tumour has a characteristic histological appearance, and this can be used to render a diagnosis. Here we have a section of the end of tibia that's been sawn in half, and you can see that there's this shining, glistening tumour that looks fairly tough and cartilaginous, and indeed is fairly tough and cartilaginous. It's a malignant tumour of cartilage. It's a chondrosarcoma. This is a typical site for it to develop. It has breached the cortex of the bone and is invading soft tissue. Its appearance is more heterogeneous. It has areas of hemorrhage. It has a malignant appearance. It's from a resection specimen and the treatment is limb amputation. Here we see the cells of the tumour. They are chondrocytes. Chondrocytes normally live a quiet, secluded life in their own lacunae. If I could be any cell, I would be a chondrocyte. And in this case, for chondrocytes, they're looking rather wild. They have rather dark nuclei, larger than normal. This is as, as bad as it gets for a chondrocyte. So you can make a diagnosis on the basis of the cellular morphology as well as the gross morphology of the specimen. And if necessary, you could make it from an aspiration sample of the tumour. Here we have another example from the head of the humerus. You can see there's erosion of the normal bone. This is a tumour that looks like it's going to behave in a malignant fashion. Here's the resection specimen. Sawed in half, you can see that the tumour is transgressing through the cortex of the bone into the surrounding tissues. And histologically, it has similar or worse appearances to the previous one with anisonucleosis. The nuclei are of various sizes and shapes. They're not nice and neat and regular as they would be in normal cartilage. Here we have a swollen knee. Does it show the cardinal signs of acute inflammation. Is it red? It's swollen. Is it tender? Is it painful? No. Show the signs of cardinal inflammation. It does not. This is a swelling of another kind. It's a malignant swelling. And you can see we've had to go a long way to get the picture. Even the National Health Service waiting rooms don't look like this one. And this unfortunately is an osteosarcoma that has reached a late stage before being diagnosed. The knee is a classical site for this tumour. Here we see a radiograph of a knee and you can see that the tumour is arising at the distal end of the femur. The tumour is larger than you might think on first impressions. It's occupying most of the end of the femur here. You can see that it's lifted up the periosteum which gives a characteristic triangle of periosteum known as Codman's Triangle, and that where it's infiltrating the surrounding tissues, it's ossifying, and the ossification gives rise to spicules of bone that are said to resemble either hair on end or the sun in splendor. These radiological features alone are diagnostic of malignancy, and here we can see the resection specimen with the tumour occupying most of the distal femur. The knee is the commonest site of osteosarcoma, then comes the hip, upper end of the humerus, and the muzzle area of the skull. Histologically, it's rather bland, it's rather unexciting for such a dangerous tumour with a high mortality rate. The nuclei don't look particularly impressive. The key to making the diagnosis is the pink substance that lies between the cells, which is known as osteoid.
which indicates that they're trying to make bone. And this indicates that the biopsy is from an osteosarcoma. But it can be a difficult diagnosis to make on biopsy alone. That is why you must take into account all the information that you have available to you. This is the wildest looking osteosarcoma that we could find. Osteosarcoma is the commonest primary malignant tumour of bone. It's nevertheless very rare, with only a few hundred cases a year in the UK. This is a drop in the bucket compared to the big league cancers like breast, lung, prostate that are going to kill many, many more people than osteosarcoma. It also makes the diagnosis difficult because people are not expecting to encounter it. An interesting feature is its bimodal distribution. It has a peak in young adults and then another peak in old people. And the second peak is because of Paget's disease of bone, which is associated with secondary osteosarcoma. Paget's disease is a hypertrophic condition of bone. The bone density is increased. The shape of the long bones can be deformed because the integrity of the shape is dependent on having a normal cancellous bone structure. And also the skull becomes thickened and the hat size may increase. Histologically, you see the characteristic thickened bony trabeculae, which, although they are thicker than normal, do not have the normal lamella structure and are actually weaker and more prone to fracture. They tend to have these characteristic tide lines in the structure that enable the diagnosis to be made. Five-year survival of this tumour continues to improve, but osteosarcoma remains a very serious diagnosis and about half of the patients will die within five years of the diagnosis being made. We've got almost to the end of the lecture without a philosophical digression, so this is the time to indulge ourselves. In your medical careers you will hear it said, quite often by surgeons for some reason, that common things occur commonly. This content-free observation is normally taken to mean that one should favour a common diagnosis over a rare one because one is more likely to be right. Uh, this statement and attitude is absolute nonsense. It is the reverse of scientific medicine and it's basically advocating that you guess. Let's unpack this a bit. There is a salivary gland tumour called a pleomorphic adenoma, mixed tumour of salivary gland, and it accounts for about 80% of the diagnoses. Cytologically, the accuracy of salivary gland tumour diagnosis is often around 80%. It follows that because 80% of the tumours are pleomorphic adenomas, a pathologist who didn't exercise any skill at all but merely guessed the answer would be right 80% of the time. This pathologist could actually do better than a pathologist who tried to work it out but was only right 75% of the time. Therefore, in terms of success rate, it does pay to guess. However, the practice of medicine is not a multiple choice exam and your patients will not thank you if instead of using the diagnostic skill that they suppose you to possess, you simply guess it. They could do that themselves. If someone presents with a swollen knee and you guess it isn't an osteosarcoma, you will almost always be right. In your career, you may never encounter an osteosarcoma, but they do exist and they will be missed if people don't try to evaluate the findings before them, even if they sometimes make a wrong evaluation. The illustrative quotation is from the work of A. E. Hausmann, The Application of Thought to Textual Criticism. Hausmann was Professor of Latin at UCL. He was probably the most distinguished classical scholar of all time, and he was a very fine poet.
author of A Shropshire Lad. He's commemorated at UCL in the Hausman Room and so far, well he is as I speak, and so far he hasn't managed to do anything to get himself cancelled, which is quite an achievement. He was also very fond of cherry trees and apparently had some planted around the college, although I've never been able to identify them, partly because I'm not sure what a cherry tree looks like as I did anatomy and not biology. The joke of the application of thought to textual criticism is that as textual criticism is an academic discipline, one would think that most of its practitioners would apply thought, but of course it's the one thing that many academics fail to do. As a pathologist, I was often approached by clinicians who would say the equivalent of our patient has bone tumours, we think they're metastases, can we do a biopsy and then you can tell us where the primary tumour is. Now, although that shows a gratifying faith in the ability of histopathologists, the easiest way to discover where the patient's primary tumour is, is to look for it. And where might you look? Well, the classic five bone metastasizing tumours. Lung, breast, prostate, kidney and thyroid. Secondary carcinomas are far more common than primary bone tumours. And if the tumours are present in multiples of more than three, a secondary tumour is the most likely diagnosis. The step to take, therefore, is to have a look at your patient to see if you can find where the primary tumour is. That concludes the introductory lecture on neoplasia. In the next lecture, we'll be looking at growth and development.